when it comes to coming up with a defining physical characteristic for a character, for villain, supervillains, snaky villains, going for the tongue tends to be an easy thing. It's easy to spot, it's slightly disturbing, and heck, there's even celebrities that have made a name for themselves just based on using their tongue as a physical attribute. All right, I better stop talking about this now before I'm sidetracked. Let's get back to supervillains and their tongues. And obviously, the supervillain most known for his tongue is probably this guy here, Venom, a.k.a. Eddie Brock, when it is Eddie Brock. Now, I know today most people think of Venom like this because, hey, he's had a movie, and that's awesome, and I'm all for characters I like getting movies. But I was a kid in the 90s. I was a comic book reader in the 90s growing up, and that was kind of when Venom hit the peak of his popularity. I guess when they started sort of overusing him, and he became sort of the guest star in every every book. Uh, I mean, even Darkhawk got a swing at him. For anyone new to the character, or maybe living in a uh, basement under a cave under a rock for the last 20 years, Venom's a character that first appeared, well, full appearance in issue 300, but he did appear in 299 on one panel. Either way, in the early 300s of Spider-Man's original numbering was when Venom was at the height of his original popularity. He would obviously grow to become an icon for Marvel Comics, and again, big enough that he could land his own movie without Spider-Man in it, which to me is still a bizarre concept since he's so linked to Spider-Man's uh, from his origin. But yeah, Venom was a gold star for Marvel throughout the early 90s from his first appearance all the way through Spider-Man 375. He was a constant tormentor of Spidey, of the webhead, before he got spun out into his own miniseries after 375, and then kind of became a sort of quasi-dark superhero, using his whole protecting the innocent as a way of turning him into less of a villain. He just wanted Spider-Man dead. All right, well, his complications aside, Venom is definitely tied into my comic book reading origins, now, my first Spider-Man comic was Spectacular Spider-Man 100, which did feature the symbiote on its own, as well as my favorite villain, Spot, and I love Kingpin, too. But this comic book was just loaned to me. It was from a pile of comic books my grandfather's friend left in his basement, and I got to read them whenever I went over his house. So that was my first Spider-Man comic. My first Spider-Man comic someone bought for me was Deadly Foes of Spider-Man number 3, which I totally loved and quickly went out and bought issues of 1 and 2, in order to, uh, or rather requested for them to be sent to me at summer camp. That's where I got this. My parents sent it to me. So I had to write them a letter saying, send the first part. The first Spider-Man comic I bought with my own money was this one. It was sort of in the middle of Eric Larson's run on Amazing Spider-Man uh, 345. And uh, it was only because I think 346 cost more money. And I, so I chose that one. But the, Venom just spoke to me, the image. For those of you needing a quick uh, flashback here to his origins, so Spider-Man gets a new suit in issue 252, although technically he got it in Secret Wars, but that uh, issue shipped after Amazing Spider-Man, so that was its first appearance for those of you in the comments section. So while Spider-Man got the suit as a backup when he was on another planet, when he returned to Earth, he had it examined by the Fantastic Four, and that's where he learned the startling truth that the costume itself was alive, that it was actually a living being and was trying to bond with him. Well, anyone who's ever had a costume try to bond with them knows you probably want to get it off, and that's just what happened in Web of Spider-Man number one. And I had this comic, and I sold it in 90s, probably for candy money. Like, what a fool I was. All right, well, in Web of Spider-Man number one is when we get to see Spidey climb to the top of a church tower and use the sonic bongs of bells because the sonics and bongs of bells annoy the symbiote, and it left him. Well, it left him, but it quickly joined with someone else who was actually in the church, retro-conning that he was committing suicide, but that's a whole other uh, Venom on Trial Daredevil mail-away issue to talk about. The point being is that it joined with Eddie Brock, who was a reporter for one of the competitors to the Daily Bugle, the Daily Globe. And in this uh, Daily Globe exclusive, Eddie revealed the identity of Sin Eater, one of the more obscure Spider-Man villains from the 80s. Well, it turned out that Eddie's story was fake, and uh, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, eventually caught the real Sin Eater, and it humiliated Eddie. So here you have Eddie hating Spider-Man for humiliating him and the symbiote hating Spider-Man for rejecting him, 
well, it's a match made in heaven. The symbiote meets Eddie. Eddie meets a symbiote. They both hate Spider-Man. And it's a uh, story told in time. This was actually, though, not the original idea for Venom. The original idea that David Michaeline had, he knew that he had the symbiote, you know, sort of uh, around and it hating Spider-Man. But his original idea was that Spider-Man was going to meet up with a, uh, a pregnant woman who was actually going to uh, very much admire Spider-Man for his heroics and think Spider-Man is, you know, a great role model, if you will. Well, it turns out that this woman is involved in a car accident, and spider that's because of a uh, supervillain Spider-Man is fighting at the time, and she loses the baby in the car accident, as well as her husband. And so this becomes the motivation for why uh, the person hates Spider-Man, and then the symbiote joins with her. The symbiote, again, being uh, you know that living creature that was roaming around looking for a host after Spider-Man was able to, uh, I guess, bong him off to... Uh, say what actually is happening in that panel. But hey, that's what it says. They're, they're sonic bongs. What can I say? All right. So that might have given us She-Venom years earlier, and that was the original idea, but it wasn't actually meant to be permanent. The idea was that the symbiote was going to sort of skip around and find different hosts, and each time it would be more deadly and more dangerous. But management being what it was, felt that that was a little too complicated, and they wanted to involve have uh, Venom be a male. They didn't think a female villain at the time was the way to go. So things changed, and the symbiote met with Eddie Brock, who had a beef against Spider-Man for ruining his career because he caught the real Sin Eater. And this is what we got, was the symbiote plus Eddie Brock as a smiling, black-suited Spider-Man with giant eyes. In fact, his smile is what upsets Mary Jane the most when Venom surprises her in issue 299 in that last panel, where uh, she tells Peter that the symbiote grew a mouth, and because she's used to seeing the symbiote suit on Peter. All right, so that brings us to kind of the core of the video and some information that I thought was really interesting about Venom. Now, in order to look at this from an art standpoint, we have to look at who is drawing Spider-Man and Venom, and that obviously starts with Todd McFarlane. Todd has since gone on to be a founder of Image Comics, creating Spawn, and all of the toy empire that Spawn hath doth given us. Well, M McFarlane is known for a lot of changes to Spider-Man, one of them being the spaghetti webbing, which editors hated at first, but then once the fans fell in love with it, they insisted on it. And... To say that Venom would, wouldn't have been as popular without Todd behind the uh, the pencils, yeah, I have a feeling that, I mean, yeah, I mean, Todd's pencils were amazing and contributed a huge, huge amount to Venom's sudden popularity because, well, Todd could draw one heck of a comic page. I kind of miss that he doesn't draw as much anymore. Either way, when he created, co-created Venom with uh, David Michaeline as the writer and basically just gave him a giant smile and a beefed up body. Now, Tom McFarlane is not the only Spider-Man artist slash Spider-Man writer to sort of screw around with things and make things different. And while Todd got the uh, the webbing to become spaghetti webbing, other artists have contributed other changes. And one of my favorite Spider-Man artists, no shocker, is Eric Larson, because he's also the writer-artist of Savage Dragon, which I'm constantly pimping out and talking about how great it is, because it is... Now, his take on Venom, you know, he immediately followed Todd McFarlane, which is actually a rule at Marvel. Anytime Todd McFarlane leaves a Spider-Man book, Eric Larson is required to follow him. What? It's happened multiple times. And his Venom is, shall we say, tongier? And the real question is, well, okay, is this just Eric Larson being Eric Larson? How did we get this iconic cover of Spider-Man that, although if you're big Eric Larson fan, you'll know that this particular image is just a ripoff of a Savage Dragon cover that Eric did three years later. Uh, there was a little time travel involved, but yeah, he's a total ripoff of himself. So Eric's Venom, definitely mouthier, teethier. Uh, Eric, Mark Bagley, who followed Eric, was able to pull back on this a little bit and return Venom more to his uh, less tonguey, uh, spiky teeth, etc. But yeah, the focus on that tongue and venom, it never left. And, you know, there's even been merchandise based on this as the feature. The uh, That extra appendage that Eric Larson, <laughs> appendage or I guess, you know, elongated tongue that, that Eric Larson gave him in his original run 
has stuck with the character that even artists following him haven't been able to reverse. So when did this happen? Well, it's this piece of art here. Probably know it better from this with the trade dress on it. So this was a new piece of Venom art done by Todd McFarlane for the trade paperback of his issues with David Michaeline. And uh, he did new art for the back, too, which I have to tell you that Eddie Brock looks exactly like Marvel Legends Eddie Brock had. Like, they just nailed it. All right. So someone held this book up for Eric Larson. And as everyone knows, Eric Larson can't see anything. No, I'm just kidding. He doesn't wear glasses. But it was all the way on the other side of the room. Eric Larson doesn't have bad eyesight. But, you know, when you hold something up and it's, you know, over 70 feet away. And he saw this, and from far across the room... He said, oh, Todd's drawing Venom with a tongue now. Okay, we can, we can add that, since this was a new drawing that Todd McFarlane did. Now, granted, there was no tongue in that drawing, but the way the, the mouth was open with the red and all the way across the room, it's easy to see how that could be misconstrued for a tongue. So you can really nail it down right to the issue. So issue 333. So, well, actually, issue 332, before that, we get... Venom, and we start, we, we, we actually are introduced to the fact that he even actually has a tongue. I mean, we assume he has, you know, an inner mouth and all that. But the first time we see it is right on the first page where he's swallowing a spider. But it quickly disappears again. I mean, it's there, but it's much more of just, you know, a normal piece of anatomy and a gross-out moment that he's eating a spider. When we see Venom actually take on the wall crawler later in the issue, the tongue is gone again, and he's now returned to his sort of McFarlane-y look. But we're not losing it entirely, and it starts to creep out and get a little bit bigger, and by the end of this issue, which is 332, we're definitely getting a lot more. But that's it. Then back in issue 333, it's gone again, and now we're back to standard Venom. So this is basically when Eric saw that comic cover, or that graphic novel cover across the room. He'd already drawn part of issue 333, which you can see from the uh, opening pages, there is no tongue. And as we get farther in, there's panels that definitely look like they should have a tongue as far as Eric Larson's style, but again, tongue's not part of it. Then, right here, that's where he clearly saw the cover for the graphic novel. You can even see the mouth is open in the same way. And there's the tongue, there's the panel, right here, comic book history, nailed down to a single panel. Venom's even saying, I want to eat your brain, which became the uh, voice chip for one of the action figures from Toy Biz, which I always appreciated. Yep, pretty much after that panel, every panel with Venom suddenly now goes from just a mouth with mean teeth to now a mouth with the most ridiculous set of teeth outside of Audrey 2 and a tongue that put Gene Simmons to shame. So there you go. That was Venom changing from not only his original concept to a visual that has defined him. And while he's had some time off, he's now back in the mainstream with movies, and I imagine his popularity is only going to soar more. I hope you enjoyed this video. It was a cool look at one of our favorite supervillains from Marvel. And if you have any questions, if I missed anything, or just have comments, leave them. I always read them, and I try to comment back as much as I can. Share and like this video, it's always appreciated. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.